Romans chapter 12, of course, comes after the first 11 chapters of Romans where we're constantly being reminded about how blessed we are of being Christians. There was a time when we were not Christians. We were outside of Christ, and it was our fault because of our sin. But through the obedience of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we can now be justified. Justification is a key word in the book of Romans. We can be justified just if I'd never sinned. That's how God can look at me through obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, show of hands, who deserves to be justified? Yeah, keep your hands down. <laughs> none of us do. None of us in this room do. None of us of an appreciable age do. But yet, in Christ Jesus, we can be. And not, it's not that we can be. In Christ Jesus, we are. We are justified. It's not that we're in Christ and maybe, maybe if I continue to be faithful for a few more years, maybe I'll be justified. No, if you're in Christ, you're in Christ and you're justified before God. You're right in His eyes. What a blessing that is. And so the first 11 chapters, we're being constantly reminded of the freedoms that we can enjoy in Christ Jesus, the blessings that we can have in Christ Jesus. We're children of God. We're, we're, we're heirs and not just heirs, we're joint heirs with Christ, as Romans chapter 8, which is one of my favorite passages to contemplate, being a joint heir with Christ. Sharing anything with Christ is just beyond comprehension. But yet, in Christ, that's what we can do and what we are doing. And so, those constant reminders, you're blessed in Christ Jesus, and so you get to chapter 12, and it's like, okay, I've been reminding you of how blessed you are by being my children. You need to live accordingly. And so we look at that in chapter 12 like, okay, get, fine. It's not going to be easy, but <laughs> I want to please you <laughs> because without you, I have no hope. I was without you at one time and I had no hope, but now I'm in Christ Jesus and I have hope. So yes, I'll, str I'll strive to follow you the best I can. I want to, I want to. So there, there's our mindset as we get to chapter 12. And so we've just been kind of slowly walking through this chapter, breaking it down into different sections. Those first two verses, thinking about our relationship with our God, devoting ourselves to Him on that continual daily basis, renewing our mind, being transformed, not being conformed to this world. We, we've already lived a life conformed to this world, and it, it was leading us to a path of hell. That's where it was taking us. But we don't want to be conformed to this world anymore. We want to be transformed by the renewing of our mind, that which is perfect, that, that, that will of God, focusing on God's teaching, focusing on His way, dedicating my life. I, I'm giving myself to you, God, and I'm going to do this every day. I, I, I want to follow you. So we've got to think about our relationship with God. But then as verses 3 through 8, we notice we need to think about our relationship toward ourselves. We need to think humbly. I, I'm a servant of God. I, I'm not in Christ Jesus because I'm extra special. I'm in Christ because I'm a servant, and that's what I want to be. We've got to think humbly about ourselves. It's through Him I can be saved. Not through me can I be saved, but through Him. And I need to think soberly, sober-mindedly about my life in, in view of following after God. And I need to think responsibly. Because in verses 3 through 8, it talks about all these blessings that, and abilities and and it could be very easy to, to recognize some abilities that we have and kind of exalt ourselves, but that's not the purpose of having these abilities. The abilities that God has given us are to be used for His service. Whatever ability I have is to be used for Him, not for me. It's to be used for Him. And so I need to think humbly, soberly, responsibly. And then we got into verses 9 through 13 and our relationship toward our church family. And, and you recall in verse 9, there's, there's three different Greek words describing three different types of love. There's agape love, there's brotherly love, and then there's family love. And the agape love we're to have for everybody. Brother or sister in Christ, not brother or sister in Christ. We're to have that love for everybody, but there's a different kind of love, a deeper love for our brethren in Christ Jesus. That, that phileo, that phileo storge, those Greek words that's in that, those two verses. And then as we got to verse 14 through 21, 
this last section of the outline, it's our relationship toward our enemies. And that's where we're going to close with on this chapter today. My plan is to to conclude the study because we're not my family and I are not going to be here for the next two weeks. And so we'll see what happens. <laughs> it's good to have a plan, isn't it? Sometimes you don't always carry them out, but it's good to have a plan. So our plan is to, to work through the chapter. And so we got down to verse 17 last week. Repay no man evil for evil. Never pay back evil, as we talked about last week, which is, th think about it, never. New American Standard Translation. Never pay back evil. Well, what about if this happened? No, never. Well, what about if, no, never, never. You're, you're following after me now. You're living differently now. God is saying this through His Word. Never pay back for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. That, that's King James Version that I have here. Your translation may be a little different. Provide things honest. A lot of times we look at this verse and talk about our ethics and how we treat people. And that's certainly involved in this because we look at that word honest, try to be trustworthy and, and truthful, and, and all of that is, is true. We should be that. But that's not actually what it's talking about in this verse. The, the, the word that's translated honest in King James and New King James comes from a word that carries the idea of being beautiful. Being beautiful. Provide things that are beautiful <laughs> in the sight of all men. And that, that just takes it to a deeper meaning. Y yes, we should be truthful. We should be honest. And we should do these things which are right. But we should do things which are beautiful. And following after a, a God-directed life is that which is beautiful. And we should be presenting that to those around about us. Uh, there's a passage. I think it's on the outline. Uh, first, 2 Corinthians 8. A lot of times we reference 2 Corinthians 8 verse, and, and 2 Corinthians 9 in our reference to our giving during our offering time of worship, and, and rightly so, because that's the context is talking about sacrificial giving and so forth. And in this, this chapter, 2 Corinthians 8, Paul is distributing a contribution to give to those saints that are in need all, all that's being described and, and talked about he's collecting that contribution and so forth and but notice verse 21 providing for honest things again the same word for beautiful things not only in the sight of the lord but also in the sight of men it says I, i'm i'm not just wanting god to see me following after Him. I'm wanting the world to know I'm following after Him. I, I'm not just giving you lip service when I tell you I follow God. I want, I want those around me to see that I'm striving to follow God. I want them to know. Now, can we always control how people view us? No, we can't control how people view us. But we can give them the best impression that we possibly can by our actions. By our, we, can, we can try our, our dead level best to show them, yes, I am following God. I'm not just talking about it. I'm not just saying I love Jesus and living according to Charles. No, I love Jesus and I'm living according to Jesus. I'm living according to what His teaching is plainly teaching me through the Word. And so that, that's the mindset there. And that's what Romans chapter 12, provide things which are beautiful before the sight of all men. You know, there, there's, there's a sense in which we shouldn't care what men think of us. And that's when they're going against the truth, but we're standing for the truth regardless. And, and you don't want me to follow the truth of God's Word? Well, I don't care what you want. I'm going to follow the truth of God's Word. There's a sense in which we don't care how they view us. If they want to ridicule us for following God's Word, well, so be it. Let them ridicule us. We're going to follow God's Word. There, there's one sense in which we, we just have to stand for the truth no matter what anybody's view of us is. But there's another sense in which we should care what people think of us. 
Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. Why? So you may glorify your Father in heaven. You want the Father to be glorified. Let your light shine, not, not so you can be glorified, but so the Father in heaven can be glorified. So there's a sense in which we should be concerned how the world views us. Should they see us as being hypocritical? No, they shouldn't. <laughs> from time to time they do, and we all fall short from time to time, but they shouldn't see us on a, on a continual basis of being hypocrites. They should just see us as people striving to follow Jesus. That, that should be our goal. Whether that is what they choose to see or not, well, that's going to be on them. But our goal should be showing them, well, this is a follower of Jesus. Because in that same context, Matthew chapter 5, talking about salt of the earth and light of the world, Jesus is talking to His followers. Jesus is not actually walking this earth anymore. But His followers are. His followers are. The world needs to see that we are indeed His followers. And that we're not compromising the truth. We're not watering down the truth. But we're li living to the best of our ability what the truth truly is. Following after Him. So providing things beautiful in the sight of all men. Notice that. In the sight of all men. And that's mankind. So that, that means women too. <laughs> Side of the side of all men. Not just the, those that you get along with, but those that you don't get along with. In the sight of all men, live a godly life. In the sight of all men, let them see Jesus in you. <laughs> in the sight of all men, let your light shine, as Matthew 5 tells us. Provide things beautiful in the sight of all. Any, any thoughts? I'm doing a lot of talking. <coughs> well, I'll do some more talking. All right. <laughs> pay no back. Pay no back. Pay no man evil for evil. Provide things beautiful in the sight of men. Don't don't be cursing. Show him what's beautiful. Following after God, despite the evil he's thrown in your face. Throw beauty back in His. <laughs> Show Him what a follower of Christ does. Show Him what a follower of Christ truly is all about. Do this in the sight of all men, if it be possible. Verse 18, As much as lieth in you. These are some powerful statements here. Live peaceably with all men. Is God the God of peace? Yeah. He is God of peace. Brings peace between Him and mankind. But no, notice this verse eight, 18. If, if it be possible. That, that just... You're reading God's Word and God's Word is to equip us to be right with Him. To, to show us how to live. It's, it's our, our road map to heaven. That's how to get there. That's following God's Word, and we come across this authoritative Word of God, this heaven-sent message that says, if it be possible. That just kind of always stops me. If it be possible, well, it should be possible. Well, keep reading. Sometimes it's not possible, what's being talked about here. If it be possible, though, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. The goal should be have peace with everybody. That should be our mindset. That should be what we want. We, we want to be right with God. We want to be right with mankind to help them get right with God themselves. We should want peace. And if it's possible, we should be doing everything we possibly can to bring that peace. If it's possible. Sometimes it's just not possible. Some, sometimes there just cannot be peace. And there's many reasons why there can't be peace. It could be just the other person just does not want peace. But as much as life in me, I should be striving to have that peace. I should be doing what I need to be doing to bring that peace. If they don't want it, then okay, they don't want it. But I'm not going to be guilty with them. There's no saying, keep your side of the street clean. 
I'm, I got to keep my side of the street clean. They may, they may want to clutter theirs up and keep it that way. Well, that's on them. I'm going to keep my side clean as much as life in me. What, okay, they, they don't want to be reconciled. They, they've offended me and I'm going to them to, to, to try to bring them back to the truth and, and righteousness in God because I care about their soul, but they don't care about their soul. They don't care that they've offended anybody. They don't care that they're living in sin. They want to continue to live in sin. Don't think anything about it. Well, what am I going to do? Am I going to live in sin with them? Am I going to pay them back with evil as talked about earlier? No. I'm going to strive to follow them faithfully. If it's possible, as much as life in you have peace with all men, there's, there's times when there's not going to be peace at that moment. That doesn't mean there never will be peace with that individual. We're just still to be letting that light shine because the, the situation could change. I mean, things in life change our perspective from time to time. And this perspective of this person may need to be changed. And it, something may happen that changes it. And we're continuing to live that godly life before them. We're, we're doing everything we can because we still want the peace. They're not letting us have it, but we, we, we still want it. And we're doing everything we can to, to, to get it. And then they finally recognize it. As, as you're, you're talking, I was thinking about a man that's now a deacon. When I first met him, he was not a deacon. <laughs> he was a wayward brother and went to a, a new work and asked the elders, you know, who, who's wayward in the community? I want to go visit them. I want to try to bring back the area before I got into evangelism. I just want to take that approach. And so me and an, another deacon started visiting and we went to this one individual and he did everything short of cursing me out, telling me to get off his property. I don't always do this, but for some reason, I just knew he didn't mean what he was saying. I don't know. I just got that vibe. He, he just didn't mean what he was saying. And so we went back and visit. Well, he told me the same thing again. <laughs> but, but I just knew he just, I don't know, there's just something about it. And so stayed in touch with him, stayed in contact with him, kept visiting him with the other deacon that knew him well and, and all those things. And then one day he comes to service. I about fell out, but I didn't let him know that, but I was thinking it. And I stuck my hand out, you know, like you preachers, you shake everybody out, you know, and <laughs> stuck my hand out after the service was over and he just didn't look at me, just walked on by. And I was like, all right, he was here, he was here. Came back again, came back again, came back again, developed a strong relationship with him. There was, there was a time when we had no peace. We had no peace, but it didn't stay that way. Just, I could have just said, well, forget him. You know, I could have cursed him back. Would we have peace today? Probably not. Probably not. Would he have come to that service that one day? Probably not. Probably not. But living the godly life, letting the light shine. It may blind some people at first, but then they may recognize, you know what? That's the light I need. <laughs> That's the light I need. So, as much as life in us, live peaceably with all men. That should be the goal. But there's, there's going to be some times when We've got to stand for what is right. And they're not. We can't have peace. We can't condone sinfulness just to have peace. We, we can't tolerate sinfulness just so we can have peace with one another. We, we can't compromise the truth of God's Word so we can be at peace with one another. No, we can't have peace. If you're going against God's Word, I can't have peace with you because I'm following His Word. As much as life in us, if it be possible, be peace with all men. Be at peace with all men. That's, that should be what we're striving to obtain is, is peace. Now, think, think about the peace. What, what is the peace that really matters? Just getting along with each other, is that what really matters? Who do they need to have peace with? 
God. That's what matters. That's the peace we're seeking. We want them to have peace with God. Blessed are the peacemakers. That's in the context of following after God. That's not talking about, well, just, you know, you work out your differences. No, work out differences with God. Be at peace with God. That's, that's the peace that we're after. We're, we're striving to have that peace with God and striving to help others have that peace with God, which they can have through Jesus Christ. So as much as life in us, be at peace with all men. Now, verse 19. <laughs> Dearly beloved, that's, that's King James, in, in verse 1 of this chapter, he says, I, I plead with you, I urge you, brethren. Verse 19, dearly beloved. Dearly beloved. Avenge not yourselves. Give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, vengeance is God's. I will repay, saith the Lord. Why... Why do you think he changes the? I don't want to make too much out of this, but why do you think he changes the wording from brethren to beloved in that passage, reminding us about the love, dearly be loved. You are loved by God. Remember that. <laughs> Everybody else is loved by God too. Remember that. We are. What was it First Peter chapter two verse four? Partakers of divine nature. That doesn't mean we become God, of course. We're still human. But we're not focused on human nature. We're focused on divine nature. We're not focused on being conformed to the world, as we talked about earlier, but we're focused being transformed, focused on God's way, living after His way. Dearly beloved, we are loved by God. We're to demonstrate love to one another. We're to demonstrate love to others. Avenge not yourselves. Give place into wrath. Now, now, whose wrath is it talking about there? The wrath of God. Because he goes on to quote, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Don't, don't take revenge. Let God handle it. God's going to work this situation out eventually. It may not be when you want it worked out, but it's going to be worked out. God's going to take care of it. This is not your work. Your work, talking to me too, your work is to lead people to me. That's your work. Live a godly life and lead people to me. Your work is not vengeance. I'll take care of that. I'll repay that. Your, your work is not to display wrath. No, your, your wrath won't cut it anyway. Your wrath won't help anything. I'll, I'll handle that. Leave room for my wrath. I'll handle what needs to be handled. It reminds me of what Abraham said, shall not the judge of all the heaven and earth do what's right? He's going to do what's right. He knows. He's perfect. I'm not. My vengeance is going to make a mess. It's going to make a mess for the person. It's going to make a mess for me. God is going to... He knows how to handle it. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Venge not yourselves. Give place unto my wrath. Now, the, this word, verse 19, where he says, I will repay. We have the same English word in verse 17 where it says, repay no man evil for evil. Same English word, but it's two different Greek words. And the, the second one, in verse 19 where it says repay, it's connected to the Greek word in verse 17, but there's a prefix added, which is basically saying, what I give back will be complete. Don't give back evil for evil, verse 17. What I'm going to give back, verse 19, will be complete. What you give back won't be. <laughs> What, 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 what Charles, Charles gives back is not sufficient. What he's saying here is what, what I give back, what I pay back, it will be sufficient. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. 
I'll handle this and I'll handle it correctly. You just focus on living a godly life and leading people to me. Vengeance is not your, your mission. It's not your mission. Saving souls is your mission. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, now, now what do you, you say when you see the word therefore? What's it there for? Vengeance is mine. I will repay. Don't avenge yourself. I will handle this. I will work this situation out. It may not happen on this side of eternity, but it's going to be worked out on the day of judgment. It's going to be worked out one day. It's going to be worked out. Just, just let me work it out. Let me do what I can do because I'm God and you're not. Talking to me. I'm not talking to you. Talking to me. Therefore, if your enemy hungers, feed him. If he thirsts, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Don't want you to have an enemy, but you're going to have an enemy living a godly life. Well, when you do, if he's hungry, give him something to eat. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. Live a godly life before him anyway. Now, did Jesus ever do this? Did Jesus practice what he preached? Was, if there was anybody who had a right to cast down wrath upon the enemies, <laughs> it would have been Jesus when he walked this earth. But is that what he did? No, he went to the cross and died there. Peter draws the sword, has bad aim, cuts off an ear, I believe. <laughs> It's a little too rambunctious and too excited and hits the ear, going for the head probably. But Jesus restores the ear, says, put your sword up. Don't you know I could call more? Notice that word more. Don't you know I could call more than 12 legions of angels? Peter, vengeance is not your work. <laughs> Gets back to it. It's not sufficient what you can do. Don't you know I could handle this? Don't you know I could just... Call down the angels. I could leave this world and go back to heaven at any moment. Don't you understand? I could, I could overthrow the Roman Empire. I mean, it's nothing to me, Peter. It's, it's absolutely nothing to me. I, the devil tempted me with all these kingdoms of the world. He was a fool because he had, oh, and there's, don't he know I'm the son of God? <laughs> Roman Empire is nothing. Put your sword up. I'm going on to the cross. I'm going on to the cross. People need salvation. And you look at the, the context before that, Jesus had spent much time in prayer. Father, let this cup pass from me. Father, let this cup pass from me. Father, let this cup pass from me. Not my will, your will be done. All right, he's got the answer to the prayer. The mob's coming to take him. All right, God's will, this is his will, so I'm just, that's what I'm going to follow. So, Peter, put, the, put up your sword. This is. This is God's will. I'm following God's will. I'm not following yours. I'm not following the will of man. I'm following the will of my Father. And so he goes through the, the, the mock trials and the beatings, the being spit upon, the cursings, and he just continues to endure this, continues to endure this, is finally nailed to a piece of wood left there to die. And what does he do? Father, forgive them. They know not what they knew. The enemy needed something. So he's going to provide what they needed. <laughs> they were hungry, so he's going to feed them. They were thirsty, so he's going to give them a drink. He was, he was providing what the enemy needed to get right with God. What they wanted to do with that is going to be on them, but he's providing the opportunity. And that's what we can do. Provide the opportunity. Uh, when you boil it all down, what matters is eternity. My hurt feelings is not what matters. Rubbing me the wrong way is not what matters. Where you stand before God on judgment, that's what matters. Where you dwell for all eternity, that's, that's what matters. Vengeance is not my work. My work is to lead people to God. So if my enemy hungers, I'm not going to curse him. I'm not going to persecute him. I'm going to give him something to eat. If he's thirsty, I'm going to give him something to drink because his soul matters. 
His eternity matters. My, my thoughts and my opinions and my, my feelings don't matter. Eternity matters. Eternity matters. This, I've talked about before, one of my favorite songs is This World Is Not My Home, Just Passing Through. I love that song. Not just because it's a catchy melody, but because it's reality. <laughs> it is, it's truth. This world is not our home. There's something else. And it's either going to be an eternal place of bliss or an eternal place of torment. It's one or the other. We need to decide which one we're going to go to and strive for it. So in doing so, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. The enemy has persecuted you, but you respond godly. It's like pouring coals of fire on his head. I heard it described one way, kill him with kindness. <laughs> when, when you look at this in, in the original and the customs of that day and time, this coals of fire on the head was like a sense of shame. And responding in a godly way to somebody that's responding in an ungodly way can bring a sense of shame to them. Can, there, there's been times in, in my life as a Christian when I've been distracted and I've been starting to go down the wrong path and a brother or sister in Christ said, hey, you're going, get back on track, get back on track. And what it did is it was like putting the heaps of coal on my head. It, it, well, I'm shameful. Yeah, I, I am going the wrong way. I need to get back. It made me look at these things in a way I needed to look at these things and recognize the, the importance of these things. And by us living that godly life, that can do that to those around about us. But us not giving up on God, no matter what the world is doing to us, can have an impact on those around us. Think about the process of church discipline. Kind of not indeed in this, this context here, but the process of church discipline. We're not practicing this process, and it is a process, by the way. It's not just a one action. It's a... It's a continual process, an ongoing process. But we don't practice church discipline with somebody because we're trying to set them off. We're trying to look holier than thou. We're trying to look down upon them. No, we're doing it because we love them and we want them to come to what's right. That's why we do it, because we love the soul. We want them to recognize where they truly are. Not, not with us, but with God. Where, where are you with God? You need to see this. You, you need to recognize this. And by continuing to be that godly example, that's because we want to bring them to God. And so it is the same principle here. Yeah, you're my enemy. I don't want you to stay my enemy. I want you to be my brother. I want you to be my sister. So I'm going to keep living a godly life. And, and maybe you will always reject that. I don't know. God's going to handle that on the day of judgment. He's going to take care of that. But I know as much as life in me, I'm following after God, and I'm going to do it before you because I love you. Don't like what you did to me, but it's not about that. I care about your soul. I want your soul with me in heaven. I want to go to heaven, and I don't want to go by myself. <laughs> I want my enemies in heaven. I want everybody in heaven. So I'm going to do whatever I can do to help that process, to lead people to the one that can truly save, and that's Jesus. So be not... We're actually going to finish this chapter. Well, I'm not done yet. But uh, You may say I sounded surprised. Well, because I am. Be not overcome of evil. What a great way to end the chapter. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. We're living in this world and surrounded by evil, it seems, and it just gets more and more and more and more, and sometimes it just seems so overwhelming. Just be good. You can overcome. Just be good. Follow the one that truly is good, God. <laughs> overcome evil. Live a godly life. You know, when I get to the point where I'm praying for God's wrath on somebody, I need to step back and say, okay, Wait a minute. <laughs> Wait a minute. 
Where, where's the Christian love in that? <laughs> where's where's the, the, the love that I need to be displaying to mankind in that? I, I need to stop and look at my own life if I start heading in that direction. And what I've found, I, I've said this a thousand times because it's just so true for me. The more I study prayer, the more I practice prayer, it's not for God's benefit, it, it's for mine. And the more I pray for somebody, the more I love that somebody. It's just... For me, maybe you can relate to this, probably can. It's hard for me to stay angry at somebody that I'm taking before the throne of God. It may start out that way. I have prayed. I hope he gets what I hope he gets it. I hope it wakes him up. But I continued to pray, and it didn't stay that way. <laughs> didn't didn't stay that. It's just it's hard to stay mad at somebody I'm talking about to God. Prayer is powerful. Prayer is powerful. Overcome evil with good. That's another way to do it. Romans, Romans 12 is a practical chapter. 21 verses, but a lifetime of study. Powerful passage. And I hope it's been helpful to you looking at these verses the past several weeks. And I thank you for your participation and your attention.